G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Talking Stuff. And this is really exciting because my lad sitting right over there, he's diseased. He's got the COVID. He's got the bug. He is a busted dude, Mr. Aaron. I like, here's the joke for you. How are you feeling tonight, old son? <laughs> well, it's one of those weeks I picked up two things. I picked up something amazing, a 70s Dalek from an auction house called Burns Auctions in Bayswater, which yeah. is amazing. But I also did pick up COVID, which is um, not so amazing. So we're deep of the heart of, of in the heart of my spare room, isolating for five days. I'm halfway through the mandatory isolation. So I love that we've only just started broadcasting and already got the docky who in there. You've brought up the Dalek. It's like, there we go. End the show right now. We've already reached our peak. We simply cannot improve upon what we've just seen. Is that right, old son? Well, we'll just have to see how long my voice holds out for, but let, let, let's let be positive and say it's going to get all the way to the end of the show. Yeah, and so fans, for the, for those who don't know, before we went on air, I said to Aaron, clearly you're not feeling the best, your voice is a bit croaky, so what I'll do is I'll get you to do all the talking, and we'll just push him to the brink, fans, what can we say? So uh, test the out those thing, vocal cords. This, this is true, the last thing that Dag said before we went live on air was, talking nerdy shit makes you feel better. Mate, it's the it's the drugs that kill River Phoenix. What can I say? <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, it's very very funny. So we're putting this thing together, and like um, you know, every time we do an episode, we go, oh, "Well, what's going to happen next week?" And it seems as if there's news and things coming out uh, all the time regarding sci-fi stuff. Now, some of it is fake, and some of it is real. Um, but it's not like we're completely short of things to discuss and to cover off because it's really intriguing to see what information is being released uh, on a regular basis and so with that in mind we're going to kick this off otherwise uh we'll be here all evening and the last thing i want to do is go like four hours into the show and aaron's go <coughs> so uh, let's get into it with a bit of this so we did promote the fact that we're going to be having a chat about megalopolis which is the francis ford uh, Coppola film and uh, to be honest with you I didn't even know that this was even being made or was even coming out or anything along those lines and I thought oh Fran um, so, um, Francis Ford Coppola doing sci-fi and I know he's like with the American Z Zootrope he did stuff with George Lucas but him doing his own actual movie I thought um, this was uh, really intriguing I did a bit of reading about it and even though it hasn't come out yet it's not due out until May and it gets screened in Cannes um, do you actually know anything about Megalopolis at all? Well, as far as I know, he's wanted to make a sci-fi for about 20 years on and off. And this was always going on in the background, but he could never get the funding or it always um, fell through or whatever. Got to say about the title, Megal Megalopolis, bit of a mouthful. Ta sounds like the biggest street size cream bar ever to me, though. <laughs> Whip out a Megalopolis. I know it gets easily confused with Metropolis. Um, it's kind of funny because... If you look up Megalopolis online, there are trailers about, but they're fake trailers. They are very good fake trailers, I've got to say, uh, but they are fake. What I found interesting, and the reason why I brought this up, is that uh, now actually he's been sort of conceiving this since 1979, since the apocalypse nowadays. And it's from what I've sort of read, uh, it's taken 100 years to get this thing made. Uh, it stars Adam Driver, who just pops up everywhere these days as, as a dude, and even Shia yeah. LaBeouf from his uh, Transformer days. Um, and it's interesting because I was th trying to think if I'm drawing comparisons here between the Luc Besson Valerian, because Luc Besson did um, uh, Fifth Element, which was a huge success, then he did Valerian, which absolutely died in the ass. Whether and with Francis Ford Coppola, despite all of his fantastic background, is producing this sci fi movie, which apparently, by all accounts, is dividing the critics. Some say it's good, some say it's not. Nobody knows what to do with it. The, the distributors don't know how to distribute it. So I don't know. It's a bit of an interesting one that someone's so big and so famous. Uh, can put something together, which is clearly a passion project, and the crowds don't know what to make of it. Well, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure of what it's about. The storyline is something like um, America has been destroyed, and it's the designing of a new city by Adam Driver, Megal Megalopolis, and no one likes his designs or something like that. So, I don't even know if it sounds like a very compelling storyline. Well, the funny thing is, and this is another reason why I wanted to bring it up, his character's name is Caesar. And I go, oh, my goodness, what the hell is the deal with that? Because when I think of Caesar, I think of Planet of the Age straight away. Uh, yeah. So his character is Caesar, and he wants to create this massive city. There's obviously a lot of Roman influence in the story. Uh, we've got no pictures to show you because they haven't released any of them. 
Um, but uh, it's like, yeah, well, we'll see what happens after it gets released in May, May 17th at Cannes and whatever like information comes from that. But for those who do like Francis Ford Coppola and his history uh, regarding uh, cinema titles, it's one to keep an eye out for. I tell you what, so fascinating stuff. What do you reckon that, Mr. Aaron? Good, yeah. And Audrey Plaza is the lead female in it. I think she's a great actress as well. Very, very cool. All right, now, it's very funny. It's almost like we're, most of our discussion tonight is all about negative stuff. So you're sort of about megalopolis and the city needs to be rebuilt, destroyed, whatever else. This trailer came out, I saw this like last week, and I go, oi, 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 what is the deal? I mean, clearly America is not a very happy country at the moment because you get trailers uh, like this from Civil War. Now, have you watched this at all, Mr. Aaron? Yeah, I have. It's a very interesting trailer. I don't know um, if it'll be that great of a movie. I don't know if it's a movie that's going to be full of hyperbole because of what's going on in America just with so many people, Trump and so many people anti-Trump, or if it's a dystopian future or, or what they're actually going to present in this movie. Yeah, so the basic premise is it's like an alternative reality. It is a dystopian future. America has been broken up into five different um, government areas, if you will, and they're all fighting amongst each other. And that's why it's called Civil War. So based on that title alone, you go, well, there's nothing happy about this. Nothing is going to end well. It has just got massive amounts of destruction and military uh, elements in it everywhere, as you can see here. And I tell you what, you do wonder, the people who are producing these things, are they sort of trying to predict what's going to happen in the US in the future? Because when you look at this, you go, it's just got nastiness written all over it. Well, the director is British, um, and it's very interesting because I think the producers wanted someone who was British so they're outside the American system so they could try and portray both sides, um, left and right, in this movie. I don't know um, from the review. The reviews I've heard have been mediocre. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a movie I'd bother going and seeing myself. I'm all up for a, a remake of um, Escape from New York or something. I don't know if this looks um, something that I would enjoy. I mean, you do wonder if the critics are looking at it and go, oh, yeah, we're not we're not really rating it really highly because it's like hitting a bit too close to home, you know. And it's just like, yeah, is this kind of pushing, like, the bounds of what could become a reality, therefore we don't really like it? Um, because you can imagine, like, it's like, not like Independence Day. The aliens come down, they blow up all the buildings. You go, oh, that's an awesome visual effect. But if you've got a story, you go, you know what? This could kind of happen in real life to a degree. You'd be thinking, no, 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 it's kind of predicting the future. Therefore, we're kind of against it. I don't know, um, but I'm intrigued by it uh, for sure. And it's a, definitely an unusual uh, premise, especially at this time of uh, of this century uh, to come out. You know, had to come out like in the late 2010s, uh, the 2010s, the 2000s, whatever. It might not have been such a big deal, but right now, I don't know. Things are a bit sen uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, sensitive. So. Uh, yeah, I just, I was just said it's a prophetic warning. Well, maybe it is, and maybe that's why some people are getting a bit turned off by it. Yeah. Sorry, dude. I was just disappointed Captain America wasn't in the trailer anywhere. <laughs> that I've seen that joke, actually. People say, oh, my God, Civil War is terrible. I'm like, what are Marvel doing? I mean, like, there's no Captain America. There's no Thor. They're really going down the Google. It's actually very, very clever. So uh, more like tonight's use. Well, yes, exactly right. And there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world at the moment. And it, it, I guess it's the kind of movie you don't go in there in a good mood and then come out and go, well, yeah, I feel, like, really excited now. So, yes, it, you do wonder. So with the, that in mind, talking about, um, uh, like, really negative shows and negative outlooks on life funnily enough that brings us into our main discussion for this evening which of course is uh fallout uh now it's funny we we, did, we just uh showed the trailer for this two weeks ago the whole season aired last thursday and of course we're talking about it tonight so if you haven't seen fallout or you're concerned about it, we're going to give some things away there are this is a spoiler alert to just be aware of that but it is a definitely a show that is kind of like hit the ground running in a lot of ways. Uh, I only just watched it yesterday and today, and I go, I don't even know where to even start this conversation because it is based on the game. If you know the game quite well, it is set in the same canon. How do you want to kick off Fallout, old son? I'd say um, Fallout is one of those series, and I know it's based on a game, but watching it, it seems to have drawn from so many other um different movies and TV shows from the genre. I was looking at going, well, this looks like it's from this and this looks like it's from this. And there was a successful show on last year called Silo, which I maybe even mm. think was done better than 
than fall out for those aspects of the show. And then I'm looking at going, a lot of this looks like Serenity. And then the music is, um, the music's very unique for a sci-fi show mm. as well, that it's got 50s period music and an orchestral background music, which I really enjoyed. Um, the character design, although unique, I'm looking at going, well, here's the Red Skull and this is from this mm. and this is from this. And the monsters all looked from another couple of shows I've been looking at. I, I it was very derivative. I didn't didn't hate it. I enjoyed it. And and what I really loved about this, I don't know if you noticed this, Dags, there was a lot of times where it it faded to black like a cliffhanger and you think it's gonna be the end of the episode, and then it goes a little bit longer, and then there's the cliffhanger. And I thought that's really good. They're giving these sort of double cliffhangers, which I haven't really seen in a show before. Um I can't say I found anything bad about the writing. I thought the story actually did set up a lot of stuff and it paid up, paid off stuff. Stuff it didn't pay off, obviously they're looking at paying off in future seasons, I would say, if this is popular enough. Some of the payoffs I was a little bit disappointed by, like nearly the whole series you're looking at what's in the silo 31 and when you get there I was a bit, oh, is that it kind of thing. But um, what did you think? Well, like you, I have never played the game uh, and I didn't know what to expect. I did have an understanding. So for those who don't know, it's an alternative version of history. So uh, post-World War II, uh, the atomic age has really taken off. There's a massive resource war. So even the history as of today, this year, uh, our history is completely different in the fallout history. So everything's completely different. That's bad English, but hopefully you get where I'm coming from. So the idea being that uh, as the decades roll on, because I think it's set in like 2077 to start with, um, technology has increased uh, and improved, but it's gone in different directions to what we have today. So for example, I still use 1950s televisions and still use text-based computers. And that for that side, it's actually really, really cool. It's a real juxtaposition between modern technology versus stuff that's really really retro and from a production design perspective it is a real like it's awesome the people who put this together must have had a whale of a time um just designing it all and making it all happen like everything this is inside the bolt itself look at that wallpaper that's fantastic um i liked the thing i struggled with is where they added in some of the humor so there's a, a it's a very gory show for those who don't know okay it's definitely not one for the kids the violence is pretty extreme but they add in drops of humour here, there, and everywhere. That's the one thing that I thought that kind of grated on me a little bit. And there are subplots that you think, well, that was a bit unnecessary. It's almost like a bit of a filler. But I really dialled into it. I really liked it, and I like how, and it, as is often the case with a lot of shows, nothing's linear anymore. You have stuff set in the future, stuff set in the past, which sets up the future, and all the answers get provided to you as we go along. Um, but I found it quite entertaining and quite enjoyable and it really sort of worked for me and I just really dialed into the look and feel of the whole show. And you were the one who talked me into watching Silo and I really like Silo, but Silo is just set in one location, so you can understand why they would put a lot of effort into that. Whereas in Fallout, we're both in the vaults and actually out in the real wide world. And for people who love world building, um, there's a lot to really dial into. Yeah, I found the production design was absolutely amazing. I think they're probably lucky that they already had probably 90% of it there from the game. So you probably got a lot of pre-production already done because the groundwork's already there. The, the humour, like you said, sometimes it did seem a bit off. And I do wonder if they were doing something directly from the game that maybe is funnier for people who, who played the game. Um, and then there's some, you know, odd and awkward moments too, like they're very naive about sex and stuff. And I'm like, no, mm. no one can be that naive about sex, <laughs> you know, um, which um, I thought was interesting. And then the other thing I thought across the board, the cast was absolutely fantastic. You can't say there was any weak links in the cast. I thought they did a great job of the casting and then the acting was all really good too. Um, Guy said that the games are great. Hope the screen will work. Uh, well, as I said, it's set in the same continuity as the um, as the games, and I don't have, don't know anybody who plays the games whether they've watched the show or not. Um, from the casting side, uh, yeah. So when uh, this character's name is Lucy McLean, when I first heard Lucy McLean, I go, "Hang on, that's John McLean's daughter from uh, Die Hard." But this is it's actually McLean, but they pronounce it McLean, and I thought, I don't know if you picked up on that, but I certainly did. I go, "Hang on, that's just really messing with my mind." Oh, I I think you're actually um, saying it wrong. I think it's Goosey. Uh, yeah, Goosey. Yeah, she gets called Goosey at one point. Um, <laughs> mm. 
but she so, does well now. The the the, the trope of or the cliche of having someone who's lived in a, in a um, controlled environment being exposed to the real wild world and very naive and just not being able to sort of work her place out in, in the scheme of the things. That's a common thing. We've seen that sort of story a, a lot of times. And uh, and you think straight away, by default, you know, she'd be attacked and molested almost from the beginning. But for the most part, it, you got to understand where it's all coming from. And it, it's, it's all good from that side of things. But the idea that she's got to try and find her father who's been kidnapped by these raiders and how that story unfolds as we go along, um, that kind of works. So yeah, a lot of the uh, the story was driven by her. When you were, <laughs> well, when, when you're talking, <laughs> <laughs> <Very good. laughs> when um, you're talking about the story elements, I was incredibly impressed with the writing, how they weaved in and out of each other really naturally, but you know they they separated and came together, uh, and it all made sense. So it was almost um, it was almost like you could. Not that you could predict what things were going to happen, but it was very logical the way things happened. But it wasn't forced. Where you know, some sometimes someone ends up with someone for no apparent reason. But this, they were tracking things and had trackers, and then they had other people, bounty mm. hunters, looking for the same thing. And then you had the knights, which are a sort of quasi-religious order, also looking for the same thing. And they they split apart and they converge. And all of their stories are very interesting and well written and make sense and it is one of those where all of the main characters seem to get you know their own storyline and story mm. arc and are quite well fleshed out you wouldn't lucy would be the main character but there's four or five characters that all have as much character development and fleshing out as she does well you made a reference to uh the brotherhood uh there's always brotherhoods in these things isn't it? and you are right it's a very like a religious order and for some reason these are the guys with all the technology and i think that's Kind of like a, um, looking at how, like, in real life, how you've got places like the Vatican and all the rest that got all the money and, and all their power. If they were uh, in this future environment, maybe the, they'd be the ones with all the airplanes and the helicopters and whatever else. But the coolest thing they've got are the mech suits. I thought, oh, man, I reckon costumers and cosplayers around the country and around the world are going to go and ape shit over this. It's like these things were freaking grouse. And they were practical suits as well. So these actually had dudes running around in these things. I mean, look at that. That is just how grouse is that, dude? I've got to say, um, obviously, this is from the game, but to actually produce that in real life and have these dudes running around with people inside them, I thought that is very, very cool. Well, I don't know if you remember, we actually had one of their heads inside the shop, just inside the door for quite a while, because it was one of the bonus editions that came with a special edition of Fallout was the full um, helmet. Very, very cool. And, of course, these guys are the only ones with aircraft. For You know, this is the Brotherhood of Steel. And I go, I'm, once again, from a design perspective, you look at the aircraft and go, that is very cool. I don't know how it stays up there, but that uh, that's kind of working for me. So, uh, once again, from a design perspective, uh, there's they've done some really, really good stuff. And there's a comment here. I'm just going to bring up the, the right image. Uh, good to see Kyle McLaughlin's appearance as Lucy's father. And of course, Kyle, I couldn't help myself. So Kyle, of course, is famous for June in 1984. And almost at the very start of the show, he's like um, drinking some water or something. And I just straight away, couldn't help myself. I was like, yeah, he's more water will mingle with the, with the vaults water. <laughs> you just can't get rid of these things from time to time. I haven't seen Kyle in a movie for decades. So uh, yeah, that was very, very good. It's driven. been a while. He came, he came, I think the last thing he came back for the, the last series of um, Twin Peaks, you know, mm. he came out and yeah, played Dougie. But um, also Lucy from that, she was in Yellow Jacket. So she's already typecast as an actress of um, TV series with cannibalism in. See, the thing about Fallout, I mean, you look at it from a superficial point of view, you've got the bad guys running around, you've got all these dudes killing all these other people, you've got the, the ghouls running around, the zombies and whatever, and you, get, you can see all that stuff, right? But then you look at the story under the story, which is all about the basis of power. And we've discussed this in some of our shows previously from other movies and TV shows. And it's all about who can get the authority over whom and how much do they want. And it turns out that vault the company with all the money who are building all the vaults in, collabor in collaboration with all these other companies, it's primarily being done from a financial perspective. And as they've said, time is their greatest enemy. And the fact that they are the ones who instigate a nuclear war um you kind of think at first vac the front like initially that that's just insane but you can understand why some people would do it 
And that was the bit that I found really interesting. It's all about the power struggle. Who is in control? And as we've seen, like with um, Hank, that's Kyle McLaughlin, McLaughlin's character, when they're in the vaults, they've got all the power. Once they learn that, like, outside the world has, like, rebuilt itself to a degree, like with Shady City, it was called Shady City, wasn't it? Um, he wants Shady to Sands. Ensure- Shady Sands. Shady Sands, thank you. Um, he destroys the city because he wants to keep the power within the vaults. And the idea being that eventually when the, what they thought the whole earth would be completely devoid of humanity, everyone from the vaults would come up and repopulate in their own image, right? And I thought that was an interesting way of looking at it because in real life you can understand why this would happen, even yeah. if you don't agree with it. And that, there's a lot there's a lot of deep and meaningful stuff going on here that uh, when you look past the superficial stuff, you go, this could probably be relating to things in real life. Well, as Dags has probably given away the the last episode and we're talking about spoilers, one of the things I really loved about this was you did see the nuclear destruction, but one of the things I had in the back of my head, there was another character, um, Max, who you saw during sort of the nuclear destruction, like Indiana Jones, he survived in a fridge. And I, and mm. I was thinking all the way through it, the timelines are out because this is meant to be hundreds of years ago and he was just a little boy and stuff and and like you said it all worked out in the end because you found they did it twice because humanity came back and they still didn't want it so they blew it up again yeah well that's right because in the timeline of the show there's actually been a war previous to the the war so um our main character uh actually fought in the wars hank actually said he fought in the wars which i think is prior to before the nuclear destruction of 2077 and so conflict is always there and it's clear to see that some people want to avoid conflict, but to do that, they've got to create conflict. And it's that old mindset, what do you sacrifice to get what you want? And is it the ends, the means justifying the ends? And I think that's a very interesting sort of poignant way of looking at it. You can look at the show and go, is what they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And if so, is the sacrifice worth it? And then there's a fair bit of discussion you could have with that. Um, Colin well, said, it's, it, sorry, it's, it said a company can make a profit from nuclear destruction. Well, that was the idea of it. And, It's a way of gaining control. And ironically, and this is the thing that I find funny, it's almost like the timing is perfect, right? They're saying that there's always conflict. This group will always hate that group. So the solution is get rid of both groups and just restart with a brand new group, right? And as of today, in a real world, that's exactly what's happening, right? And this group's fighting with this group and there's just no solution to these problems. So you can almost think they're saying, here's a solution. It's not a good solution and it's not going to work for everybody. But, hey, this is one avenue you can consider. It's madness. Well, the, the whole thing is capitalism, where they're saying we're a company that primarily sells fallout vaults. If the world is heading for peace, we're not selling as many vaults. Yes, that's right. And they actually cover that off and say, oh, the peace talks are actually going too good. We need to upset them. Um, and the idea being that the people in power are all sort of happily stored away in their uh, you know, suspended animation cells. And as a consequence, they just push the buttons and the world blows up and yeah, it is interesting and to see if there would be people in real life with that kind of mindset. And it just goes to show that people like you, me, and everybody watching right now, we we're just like nobodies in this scheme of things. So we're at the mercy of uh, whoever's making the big decisions. And, uh, yeah, yeah. We're interesting the, stuff. We're the, we're the extras in the day after. We are indeed. Um, speaking of ghouls, so, of course, you've got this main guy who's been around. This is uh, Howard Cooper. who I like this one. It has, who's the Hollywood actor from, you know, what will be another 40, 50 years from now. And, of course, he has existed throughout this entire time. Um, and, of course, the idea being that he was actually one of the people involved with the promotion of the vaults uh, back in the early days. And I like really like the fact that they dealt with his character that way. So you get to see his entire journey from what was starting off as being a good idea then suddenly being, oh, that's a really twisted and cockeyed idea, being the victim of that idea and then seeing the aftermath of it, aftermath of it later on. Um, yeah, yeah I, it kind of worked for me, actually. He was, he was actually you see really that, and, it, and, it's, and it's all out of order as well. Yeah. And by, by far, he was probably my favourite character um, from the show. He's definitely a, a great anti-hero. He definitely is. And for those people who love their violence and love their destruction, I showed this picture earlier, the world building is awesome. The smashed up cities and all the rest of it, it, it looks grouse. It's like a really ramped up version. It, looks almost, it does look a computer game. If you ever played some of the maps on uh, Call of Duty and whatever else, where cities have been completely obliterated, um, yep. it looks great. And naturally, in that environment, people wouldn't live in the cities because there's 
nowhere, nothing there. They just sort of live in uh, towns outside of the city. I did get confused though when they mentioned the town called Philly. I thought that was Philadelphia, but it's obviously just obviously just up the road, effectively from uh, Los Angeles. Yeah. So, with the violence, yeah. they they didn't pull back on it either. There are scenes no. where you, you get you get the guy's head in their hand uh, yeah. of the metallic suit, and they just crush it and explode. So, if you're a gore hound, there's enough in in it to keep you interested. Yeah, and some of it's in slow motion as well, which I thought was kind of groovy. And you can tell, yeah, it's interesting way you're looking at it. It's like, well, in this environment, there's going to be a lot of violence. It's not going to end well. And to be fair, most of the people who get it badly are the bad guys anyway, for want of a better term. And yeah, the guy's head getting crushed. You go, yeah, that kind of works. I it, it worked for me. I, I don't know. I, I kind of liked it. But by the same token, I could realise, yeah, it's, this is not the kind of show for everybody, as I said earlier, not the kind of show I'd show Lynn. And uh, yeah, it can be a little bit upsetting, but by the same token, that's the nature of the world that they live in, and I found that to be quite enjoyable. So, I did, but, I did, uh, find, yeah. I did find it strange that the the major currency now is bottle co- bottle caps. It would make sense, wouldn't it? So you dig them up out of the ground, and this is metal bottle caps. I was thinking like pure milk plastic bottle caps, but no, it looks like metal bottle caps. Um, it kind of works. I don't know if it's one dollar for a Coca Cola and five dollars for a Pepsi. <laughs> 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 um. But they do cover off in great detail how the whole environment works, how it looked in 20, say, 2077 and then in the future as well. And uh, and as I said, if you're a real devotee of production design and detail, it is very, very clever. I mean, they do actually present that question in the vaults. They all wear the same blue jumpsuits. And Howard Cooper, who before the vaults are built, says, what if I want to wear a green one? And there's no answer to that question. And you do wonder, why does everybody wear exactly the same clothes in the vaults because they've been conditioned not to make changes go with the status flow and just uh you know, i did i did that. wonder were were the suits based on his cowboy costume because he was wearing a cowboy costume and that would have come before the suits because he yeah was he, did the, he did the commercial remember he did the commercial he put they, his wife gave him the suit he put it on remember he said it was a little bit on the slug side he did the promo did the thumbs up bit right which gets yeah. referenced at the start um and yes there would have been a link there and of course so he when he's seeing pictures as a ghoul later on of the the vault tech promos that was him and i go oh that is that is a nice little bit of circular logic um yeah. i do like this from uh yes nuke nuke cola uh yes exactly right forget coca-cola go to go to the nuke cola it's a blast i mentioned the promos you can come up with that oh my god it's it's a blast and a half that's that's for sure sir <laughs> 10 times the uranium of ordinary coke yeah, and of course, in this world, I mean, they're dealing with radiation poisoning all the time, the RADs, if you will, and they've got to have med- and there, there are medications that exist that don't exist in real life, uh, which I thought was interesting. So I thought, how are they going to fix that? Oh, they just inject them with something. They're all good to go. And there's a constant reference to the Reds, you know, the Russian, oh, it wasn't Russian, the Reds, or the communist threat. And I'm thinking, are they talking about Russia? Because it was obviously Russia throughout the 50s and whatever else. Are we now sort of moving off to someone else, whether it be China or somebody else, uh, altogether so but they never mentioned who i thought that was interesting so yeah mm. yeah overall i thought it was a, a really good show yeah i totally agree with you so for those who haven't seen it yeah we've talked about it a fair bit and probably spoiled most of it for you but uh it's well worth having a look at there's only eight episodes and but they go roughly for 45 minutes to an hour of pop and uh so there's a fair bit uh, to get through but um, there's a lot to look at and it's quite groovy so yeah One and of course there will be season two sorry dude what was that one whole season, and they haven't even given the poor dog a name yet. Yeah, so the, I don't know what the deal was with the dog. Uh, CX, so I don't know what, why. So there's a lot of things we haven't been explained yet. I thought, who are these people? Why are they producing these dogs and doing all that? So clearly that's based on the game. Um, yeah, here we go. New could call a fizzing fusions. <laughs> I love it. It is very cool. I reckon for costumers and anybody who likes their, um, uh, their marketing campaigns, the posters and all that, there's a million different props and things you could build from this. There's a sequence in the show where you've got two, two guys in the vault. They're voting against each other to be the overseer, and they put up these ultra-bland, boring posters, vote one for me, and they're complimenting each other. Oh, great campaign. The posters look great. I printed 10. I printed 12. And it's like, that is just awesome. I absolutely love it. And neither of them win. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. What do you reckon, dude? Well worth checking out? Yeah. Like I said, it's a thumbs thumbs up from me. Good stuff. All right, very, very cool. So go and have a look at the old Fallout Kids. It is particularly groovy. All right, with that in mind, we are going to move on to our next bit, uh, which we're going to come up. Is, our next bit is this. This is 
we don't, Aaron doesn't want to talk, but we're now we're going to make him talk. Let's see what he has to say. A question. So this one, funnily enough, relates directly to you. Uh, I was thinking about this recently. And so for those who don't know, and I think everybody does, you run your own store, you're a pop culture collector, have been, and a dealer, have been for decades and decades and decades. So you're buying merchandise, primarily toys, primarily, and you sell merchandise and it's all good to go, right? So my question to you is, without warning, if you, and this is you personally, were given free reign to produce your own merchandise, what would you make? And by free, mate, I mean official, licensed, a whole bit. You've got the company ability, off you go. What would you make? Well, this is this is actually going to be really boring and a short answer to the question. I love the character options Doctor Who figures, and I love the classic series ones a lot more than the new series ones. And when, when the new series was doing amazingly well, they'd be able to pump out a lot of the classic stuff as as well because the two lines kind of subsidized each other now doctor who hasn't been selling as well um you don't get as much as the classic stuff i would produce every single figure from the classic run in that range so all the classic doctor who figures would get a release that would be my dream so you could get maybe box sets of every single story from the classic series do you reckon it would sell no, but you said I could have free reign to produce yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's still going to be a. So where I was coming from with this, um, and this isn't a criticism whatsoever. No, it's good that you've even thought about it. One of the funny things is, as you know, new merchandise is produced all the time. Uh, well, you stick with toys. It doesn't have to be toys. We'll stick with toys, and and especially where we're seeing with sometimes you see with Doctor Who and Star Trek, but and even Star Wars, items get produced. And even in your shop, we've looked at items and go, why would you make that? Whose idea was that? That is a really dumb idea. And I'd like to think that at some point everyone has an idea saying, well, if I had the ability and I had the license, I would do that. But I've never known what that is because it's easy for everybody to be critical of what's coming out. And sometimes those criticisms are well and truly um, justified. But I was always wondering to say, if you, they said, here's the license, what would you make? Now, one thing, it's one thing to say, I'll just produce blah but it's still going to be financially viable and that collectors and or people will want to buy it. You don't just make it for yourself. Otherwise you can just do that anyway. I'll I'll validate what I said with the Doctor Who. They would sell. You'd produce the minimum run, which is 10,000 units, and they would sell out. Mm. But they wouldn't make you a lot of money. There's 10,000 people worldwide that would buy every single classic Doctor Who figure released. You wouldn't lose money. Maybe what you're asking, are there licenses that have never, ever been done that if they were done would sell? And there are a few. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that we were growing up with that hasn't come back, but if they produced figures of it, it would do incredibly well. If they did a box set of Monkey Magic with Monkey, Sandy, Pigsy, um, Tripitaka and the horse, I reckon they'd sell the first lot out instantly they might not sell more than that that's definitely a license i don't think anyone's ever picked up and would sell i don't even think there's pop vinyls of those Mm. no i don't think i think i think if they did an 80s hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy range not the new hitchhiker's guide but the the bbc version i think they'd be just as popular as the doctor who toys and maybe even bigger because hitchhiker's guide as a book has continued to be popular and has fans and there's absolutely nothing um merchandise wise with hitchhiker's guide and even when they used to make latex babel fish for conventions they'd all sell out um so there are definitely niche things that if they brought back would be really really popular for one run i think beyond one run and you're pushing it but there are definitely instances you could do like that Hmm. Um, I like this one from Greg. He actually thought I mean producing your own merchandise of you of you, uh, some and action figures. Uh, no, even I think there's a limit to how much people would buy so those. For, for that, I think I would have Buddha Aaron, and you just sit him in the corner and you rub his belly for luck. Yeah, and the problem is out of and all this COVID germs <laughs> just come out. So there you go. Um, very, very you cool. are absolutely uh, you're absolutely right though that you do get figures through, and you you'd go what marketing genius thought that figure would sell and, and that's, generally that's... genuinely you get a marvel wave and there's like five good figures that everyone wants and one figure 
you have to look up to see what what they actually were and why they would be pr producing it. It's really weird. Because and there's like there's a couple of comments that have come through. Like Angie said, Forbidden Planet. Uh, William said, Day the Triffids, and Angie said, in Space Nine Ninety Nine. You got to be a bit more specific. You can't just say the brand name, guys. You got to say what the product is, because ultimately, when someone, as you said, a thing comes in, you go, whose idea was that? But clearly, someone thought that's worth manufacturing, and because there's a lot of time, effort, and money to manufacture a piece of rubbish, right? So. To say to you, say for you, here is your license. Now, whether it be Doctor Who, whatever, whatever, whatever. And you can say, well, I've got to produce, design a product, produce a product, and it's got to work. You can't just produce rubbish for the sake of producing rubbish, even though rubbish does get produced. It's got to be something that'll actually work because all the merchandise that you personally, even you have in your house or in your store that you own and you love, someone had to invent that. Someone had to yeah. design it, make it, and go, yeah, this is actually something that's going to sell. So I'm putting the onus on you to say, what would you do now? You mentioned about doing uh, all the classic Doctor Who's. Is that is that what you mentioned earlier? Yep. Yeah. 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 Exactly right. And you go, well, okay, that's great. I've done that. What else? I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's probably a really good thing. And there's probably people watching this who be going, that which is awesome. I would buy stuff like that. Anything else beyond that? Just out of curiosity. Well, I thought, find it's interesting with what's been brought up, like Forbidden Planet, Day of the Triffids, and Space 1999. Nothing new. There's nothing new, is there, that people have instantly seen something and go, I wish they'd get a toy of that. The classic Trifford from the BBC version with the trumpet and, mm. and all of that, I think would be an amazing toy. I don't, I don't, I've seen people do custom ones. I don't think there's ever been a really official one done. Space 1999 is, of course, they've done stuff, but the Eagle is always going to sell because it's such a classic toy. Mm. It's actually a high cost toy to produce because of all the metal yeah. struts on it and stuff so it's easier to produce as a model kit but for a toy manufacturer it's hard so they're always going to be expensive jerry anderson stuff in general i think um is always going to have life because it's a kid show that sort of always comes back with a new generation of, of things do you know though when you ask that question if there really was a surefire product that millions of people would want I wish I could think of it because then you'd make money. That's what everyone tries to do. Um, I get I asked, sorry, no. I get asked for stuff and it's usually things like they produce a line of horror figures. You get like movie maniacs and you'll always get Freddy, Jason, um, you know, Leatherface, um, Pinhead and stuff like that. And the line kind of peters out when it gets to the lesser mm -hmm. figures, but then down the track on the secondary market, it's the figures from the more obscure shows like The Thing or The Fly that end up going for more because you, you don't see them as much. I think waves of cult figures where you get like Maniac Cop and the little girl from Poltergeist in front of a TV and, all, and you know, classic iconic images that have never been done of toys. You'd get, you'd get definitely people who would collect them. I don't know if that's what you're really looking for. No, that's though. okay. I mean, because uh, and now this, I'm going to get to Shane in a sec. Because in the end, the people who invented and conceived pops, right? You know, the day before that idea came up, they didn't exist, and someone said, "Hey, that's a good idea. Let's just do that." And look where it is now. And of course, McFarlane um, uh, ended up creating a whole range of different toys and figures from movies and TV shows. And there was a time when they didn't exist either. So um, to come up with the idea. Admittedly, they've got to go and buy the license to make it happen. But to actually conceive of it and actually produce it and do it, and you go, you know what, that is a really good success story. And someone like you who deals in merchandise all the time as your day and day job, be curious to see to say, well, what would you do, dude? It's like, here's your license. Off you go, son. Yeah. You, can't, you can't tell because, you know, at the same time as Pops came out, um, Mighty Mugs came out, which mm. were almost the same, and you have Dorbs as well. And Pops took off and the other ones didn't. And, you know, you're like, how did that happen and marketing mm. getting the right Maybe. licenses I, d I don't know even pops as a as someone who's been in the collecting field for ages i thought they were going to be like beanie babies i think they've been around for for two decades now i thought they'd have a five-year life and then be in the bargain bins but they're still going so you just can't tell how true uh christy made a point of saying george lucas was that genius and he was and look where he is today so it's worked out well, quite well classic robot series once again Ange, it's got to be something that is viable okay uh to a large market or a good market to make it to recoup costs that have been invested into it and that's the reason why 
It's because uh, anybody can, especially now with 3D printing, you can 3D print your own merchandise, go nuts and have a whale of time. I've got a collection of all these things that nobody else has got. Yay, yeah, team. But no one else has bought them. They don't exist outside this uh, your, the house you live in. Uh, Shane's made a point about a Monty Python characters, films and TV shows. Uh, Chrissy made the Eagle 5 Mega Made. Oh, yeah, it's true stuff from Spaceballs. Spaceballs, ironically, didn't get any merchandise, even though they were talking about merchandise within the movie, um, yeah. which I thought was kind of groovy. And... Yeah, so it's an it's an interesting sort of question, um, but uh, you put that on the on the on the laps of people and to say, well, what would you make if you don't like these things that are being made? What would you do? And you probably find most people don't actually know what it is that they would want until they well, see something can, that they don't want. You can never tell from from when we did the rip it off the card. One of the things we'd get in was cheap stuff, and I got those critters, which mm. were really cheap. But when they came, they were pretty amazing, and I probably you know, ordered them as a joke and they were, you know, $8 plus postage to get here or yeah. something ridiculously cheap. And they look so good. I put them in the shop for $99 each and they all sold instantly. So I got more and they all sold instantly. And I ended up getting about 10 in because it was just from a mm. classic sci-fi people grew up with and there's no merchandise anywhere at all. You've just got to come up with like ideas like that. I do find it funny that you go to the say you used to go to the Victoria Market and it's and then you got the knockoffs right the stuff that is just like a, it's a clearly a Spider Man character but the package has been modified a little bit instead of saying Spider Man it says Spider Guy or something like that. Someone yeah. in Asia thought that was a good idea to create, design it, print it, send it to Australia. The back of the card is just completely blank cardboard, and yet for some reason there's a market in there somewhere because you know, these things are not licensed. For people to buy them and sell them, and for these things to keep getting made, so it's a co it's a funny world that we live in, where knockoffs actually have a market you know, out there, and some people make a point of buying knockoffs because it's a bit of a thing, and well, yet I've they'll still pop up from time to time, and you'll be going, "Whose idea was this?" I've seen it at Vic Market, Spider Man lying on the ground with a machine gun, yes, you know, I and, have you to. Go, yeah. <laughs> and they and they sell them, and you're just like, "What kid thinks?" I love Spider-Man, but he's even better with a machine gun. <laughs> All right. So before I, I look at this one, yeah, Daniel, your space falls the flamethrower. Okay. So it's keeping it simple. Of course, Star Wars is such a gigantic line and there's so much merchandise produced. If someone said, okay, Mr. Aaron Challenger, here is the license to produce Star Wars merchandise. doesn't matter what it is. What would you do? Original trilogy. If you were making money, you'd have to go through original trilogy. Did and you specify what it is though? It would be the classic um, action figures, but I I do think they need someone more creative in there. We don't need some of the waves we get. Um, I think, you know, they the, the trouble is Disney need to make money off of what they're producing, so they try to produce toys off of everything. Mm -hmm. The market isn't actually there for everything. What actually sells is the original trilogy and I guess some of the prequel trilogy um, sells a little bit of Ray and a little bit of Mandalorian stuff, but the the main sales of the original trilogy. And what I would do, um, and I think it trades on nostalgia. There are some kids that buy new stuff, but not a lot. It's mainly guys in their forties and fifties now. Mm. Um, and I I would play on nostalgia. Where when I was growing up, the best thing I ever ever saw was when you'd get the catalog and you'd see like the Ewok village all set up like mm -hmm. with real trees and stuff. And it made the toys look so much better. I'd be doing like one, one movie a wave and you get, okay, this year you can collect all of Jabba's palace and all of the monsters from Jabba's palace and every pet and every part you get, you build something that makes a throne or a room mm -hmm. from Jabba's palace or the torture room or something. But actually still have you, you st what you're doing you're selling an idea where you have this picture of all of it set up like an amazing display in someone's house but you're selling one item out of that so it looks awesome but you're selling the you know the 120 dollars figure out of that and when you get that home it isn't as awesome without the rest so you have to go back and keep buying more and more the one issue star wars has and i don't know how you fix it they don't produce enough of the good stuff for the fan base who want it to get it all without having to resort to the secondary market because it gets bought by 
scalpers or it just it disappears too fast um and that's a real killer for collectors because some people do enjoy the hunt i do and some people are happy to buy half of it when they find it and then track down the other half online but other people if they can't get it all for retail price they're just not going to collect it in the first place so that's another issue so i would do a line that plays heavily into nostalgia and then deliver the product that you know we all wanted as kids very good. Uh, just winding back to the, um, we're going to wrap this conversation up. Uh, the um, knockoffs from the from the market. I like this one. Uh, yeah, because I always get the the the, the what do you call the translations wrong. Uh, robot guy, the furniture of law enforcement. I think that's an absolute classic. Uh, very very cool. Money bags has said about the old EU for Star Wars and gaming stuff. Always sells. It does. Um, and Russell Key Babes has said Blake's seven figures. Yeah, it's an interesting one because everything you buy, as not people buy, someone had to invent it, create it, design it, and then out it comes and you go, oh, that's a good product, that's a bad product. But um, given the option to do it yourself, some people sit there and go, you know what, I don't actually know what will sell and what wouldn't. So anyway, it's good. Very, I very good. See, Sorry. I could see Reaction Toys doing a series of Blake Seven figures and them selling really well. Yeah, I tend to agree, actually. There's a bit of a fan base out there for Blake 7, which is particularly cool. All right, so something that used to sell a lot of, and now there's a bit of a struggle. We're going to move in there after discussion. It's the demise of movie posters. Uh, this is an actually one of the examples where uh, this topic was actually suggested to me by somebody else. So if people have um, ideas for things that we can discuss on this show, by all means, pass them, send them through to us, because as I said, I didn't think of this. Someone else has thought of this, right? Movie posters, okay, they've been around since, obviously, movies have been around since the dawn of time, um, but they were always physically printed, okay, on paper, rolled up, places like Movie Ollie used to sell them. Now, we're talking about official movie posters, not your cheap knockoffs, not your, you know, like, funny enough, we are talking last week about posters coming from magazines. We're talking about officially produced movie posters, okay? Cinemas use them to promote the films. It's all well and good, but there's a collector side from uh, behind the scenes where people buy and collect old uh, by official movie posters i had uh, some i'm sure you do a lot of people own thousands of them been around since the dawn of time the issue is that currently cinemas even though the posters are being fit, are designed the pictures are there they're not being printed because cinemas are now using digital screens to present them right so the question is uh as an issue if you're a movie poster collector how can you collect something that doesn't exist and does that mean as the years roll on, movie poster collecting for movies that are being like, for, we had Civil War earlier, right? The trailer for that. I want to buy a movie poster for Civil War. I've got the artwork. I can find it online. I can do a cheap you know, office works printout. But if I want an officially produced movie poster of Civil War, does it exist? Because when I go to the cinemas, all I'm seeing is a digital screen showing posters instead. And this was actually brought up to me by Spankin. We said, you know, as a movie poster collector himself, What's the future of it? Is it all dying out? I understand why they're doing it, because from a cost perspective, they don't have to print anything. They stick it on the screen. They can change it with the press of a button. What do you reckon, dude? Well, it's interesting because even um, it was only oh, maybe a year ago now I was driving to work and I saw they were replacing the bus, um, bus stop posters mm. with digital screens. So even the bus stop size ones now don't have... Um, a printed poster they actually have changeable images in a digital screen the other thing about that when that happens imagine the guys whose company printed all the bus stop posters their company probably goes under because yep. that's a huge thing to lose um and it is probably printers are probably a, a dying trade as everything's gone digital i would think every poster would not every not every version of every poster but i would probably think every poster still does get a limited paper release because there's always going to be some cinema somewhere that has never gone digital but it's going to be fewer and fewer of these posters around so that's the point right as of today that you're right there might be some five years from now by the time we get to 2030 right the designs will be there and if you say i want a printed poster where do i get one from now i suggested it's funny enough using what you just said as, uh, as a bit of rationale if you're saying, oh, I want an officially produced movie post site, I want to print it myself, I want a proper one, I may have to go to places like Johannesburg or somewhere completely in some random country where they still say, well, we don't have digital screens for our cinemas. We'll print this thing ourselves. 
and that's the only version I can get. I can get a South African release of uh, Ray, the new Star Wars movie, when it comes out four or five years from now. So, or the Mandalorian movie, or whatever else. But people who love their movie posters for their collecting, they're uh, they're going to be a bit of a pickle. It'll be um, Spankin will get all these posters from India, and there'll be all those really badly painted ones that are the only ones that exist. You know what? We're making a joke of it, but the reality is that might be true. And just quickly, I've got to say hello to Adrian, who's just joined us. I haven't seen Adrian for years, but uh, good day, Adrian. Good to see you. Um, and and of course, Adrian's a filmmaker himself. He might have a bit of a, a thought on this. But it was an interesting scenario, and, I, and of course. Logically, it makes sense, right? It's like, you know, as you said, saves paper, the environment, the cost of printing, blah, blah, blah. All the companies who print, they're all going to be going out of business. And the cinemas will be going, this is awesome. I just download the picture and press the button and the thing cycles through. It's like lobby cards. They're a dead entity. And those who collect posters tend to also collect lobby cards. I don't, they're long gone. So if yeah. you wanted lobby cards for anything from the 1950s, sure, there, there were millions of them produced from movies. Well, Today, none. It's the same with... Um press kits they became digital yes. press kits and you only get a digital press kit now but um i think the one loophole in this is people like um icon who are the ones that print the reproductions of movie posters they're not movie poster size so when you go to the cinema it's a one sheet which is actually a lot yep. bigger than you realize when you get at home if you go to in into any kmart or store that sells posters like aaron's collectibles they have posters, but they're not the same size. I think those posters will always be around, and it might be the only way you can get a paper version of your favourite movie because what will happen, the digital files will get sent to Icon, and Icon will judge how popular the movie is, and then they release it, and that might be the only paper release there is of that movie. And I totally agree with you. And there are some reproduction posters you can get that are one sheet size. Now, I ain't to talk about one sheets because they're the ones that cinemas use. So I'm being very specific about that. I'm not talking about three sheeters or quads or anything along those lines, just so people are aware of it. Um, Christy's mentioned about independent cinemas were the only place you might be able to see physical posters. That's true. But at some point, even they will go, well, I can't. The printers are all out of business. I have to go to a digital screens. To be fair, these days, TVs are so damn big. You just stick them up uh, vertically and bang, there's your image straight away. It'll probably even fit the thing. Uh, quite yeah. nicely. There is a difference between officially presented printed movie posters and limited cinema only posters. We're talking about official cinema release posters, Ange. They, as uh, um, Aaron said, they are classed as one sheeters. Funnily enough, most of the ones in Australia were produced by a company called Maps, M A P S. Um, not sure about overseas ones, but there's a big market for collecting official movie posters. And to be fair, the further back you go, once you go past the 60s, the 50s, the 40s, the value of these things just skyrockets. Right, especially for big successful movies. Um, for myself, people who collected Star Wars, Star Trek, and whatever else. So, for example, if I was still collecting Star Wars movie posters and I said, I want movie posters for the next future Star Wars movies, Mandalorian, Ray, and what it comes to, they probably won't exist. It's like, well, you know, sure, I can get them printed at Office Works and whatever, but they're not official. And I'm sure that may end up being the case for some people. Uh, what was the last movie you remember that had lobby? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, off the top of my head, funnily enough, Batman in eighty nine, Batman in eighty uh, June in eighty four. I the was last, never a lobby. I was never really a lobby card person, but I don't think they've been around for decades. Lobby cards. The last, the last movie that I got a set of lobby cards for was actually The Sixth Sense. So that's going back twenty years at least. That's actually not too bad, actually. Um, it's sad to see the loss of daybills. He used to see at the local cinemas. Daybills are an Australian invention, funnily enough. He, um, our friend Spankin, he collects a lot of daybills. Most people do because they're the long, skinny ones, for those who don't know what we're talking about, um, yeah. because they're they're not as big, right? You can get them in frames, put them on walls. They look fantastic. But they're mainly for Australia and America. They don't actually have daybills, which is kind of interesting. But it's it's a scenario that you go, well, that kind of sucks. It's the, uh, what do you call it, the law of unintended consequences, what seems like a great idea in paper, these are the people who get impacted. It's the same principle. It's identical to the same principle as physical DVD media, Blu-rays not being produced, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. But it might be affecting a different market. Yeah. Well, how much, I mean, how much cheaper it is for the cinema, well, for the studio where they produce the press, well, not a press kit, but the publicity kit for a movie that is no longer physical and they can just email it to every cinema in the world don't have shipping, don't have printing, don't have people stealing posters and you have to replace them, don't have an underground market who are selling them anymore. I mean, it's sad because it takes away that level of um, intimacy that fans have with collecting their favourite movie. 
Totally agree there. Uh, Shane said he used to collect movie posters from the Aussie distributor. That's probably United uh, International Pictures, UIP, in the early 90s. They were printed in the thousands. There was definitely something that is, uh, um, what do you call it, exclusive about having posters that are cinema produced. In other words, they're for the cinema. They're not like, as you said, the knockoffs, the reproductions. These are the official release ones. There used to be a store yeah. in Melbourne called Moviola. They only dealt in official cinema release posters. There's a store also in the Chapel Street Bazaar that did the same thing. So that made them automatically more valuable than just you know, cheap reproductions because they were the real thing. And But uh, by today's standards, you can't necessarily get them anymore. The world is changing and not in a better way. This is a good example of that, funny enough. Uh, even though in the grand scheme of things, it only impacts a small number of people. But 30 years from now, people are going to say, have you got any movie posters from 2024 onwards? And they go, nope. And they just stop printing them. It's like, friggin' hell. It's like, um, I wonder um, if... why did lobby cards die? It was due to the multiplex, probably because then they had to print lots of them. With the lobby cards, of course, it used to be eight in a set, and of course, physically design them and print them. And I think they just lost their lost their interest. And uh, uh, with multiplexes, as you said, showing like a dozen movies in a dozen different cinemas, that's a lot of lobby cards to stick on walls. And they go, no, can't be bothered. That's my gut feeling. I yeah, think it was. Good. You're absolutely right. You'd go to a sort of a cinema too, and they'd have, you know, maybe six different movies playing a day. Yeah. And, you know, the yes. managers would get the envelopes of lobby cards and they'd basically be in charge of putting up their own display. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it comes when everything is, you know, now there's just Hoyts and Village and Readings, a couple of... When there was more independent, there was more creative, I guess, more creative on the end of the cinema to display stuff. But when Village gets something, they obviously say every village has to look exactly the same. So... Yeah. Um, that's how it happens. I, we have a friend who used to do the um, the presentation and the displays at Knox. Justin mm. he used to mm. uh, yeah. he and you know at that time the manager had the you know the power to be able to hire someone to make a display. I don't think that happens at all anymore. I think they're no. told here is the here is how this movie is advertised or not advertised, and that's that's how it is. Yeah. So it's an unfortunate side effect of, of modernising the world. Um, as I said, it'll only impact a, a minute amount of people in the grand scheme of things, but it will impact somebody. So, And our friend Spanken, who, as I said, he brought this up. He's been talking about the potential death of cinemas for quite a while now, and this is just one nail in that particular The, the one coffin. thing, though, is you have... Um, sorry. You have yeah. a cinema chain in America, which is more of a cult um, chain, the Draft House cinemas and they often get retro movies and replay them and they design their own posters for them and they still have physical posters and some of their posters because they're just made and printed mm. and displayed for one weekend or a couple of weeks go for thousands and thousands of dollars online it's an instant collectible and you do wonder if it will be a news story this is the last movie with a cinema poster and if everyone will scramble to get it because they want the last movie poster. Yeah, it's like the last video store closing down. We're about to finish up. I'm just going to show this one. Uh, they made the same mistake with books. People assumed e-books would replace printed books, but they would overlook that. Books are, more popular than books are more popular than just the text. Funnily enough, I was on the train two days ago and I saw a girl, young girl, reading a physical book and I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, my God, how often does that happen? That's a true story. Um, so, and as you said, yeah, about, about books, people uh, having to do with Kindles and whatever else. So, yes, there's still a place for printed books in the world. And, yeah, uh, and Ed's are saying, you can't remember the last time we saw a lobby card standees. Yeah, they're, they're definitely in the dustbin now. They're, they're gone. The good thing the is... Last, sorry. The last standee I saw, which was popular, was the Barbie one where it was a Barbie box and you could go and stand in it okay. and look like you were a doll. Oh, yeah. Yeah, gimmicky things they'll still produce because they put one in a cinema and then just throw them out afterwards. Um, the good thing is at least with posters, they still design them, right? So someone's still designing, they're just not printing them. So at the very worst, if you do need to print them yourself, it's something. It's not official and probably getting trying to get them one sheet size is probably going to cost way more than the effort uh, involved to get it in the first place. But if that's your thing, you never know. And you never know. Imagine the scenario. X many years from now, someone walks into your house and you've got one sheet's printed out of Ray and Mandalorian and whatever Star Wars movies are coming out. And people go, where did that come from? So I did it myself. It's not official, but it's better than nothing. And I reckon people would go, that looks awesome. So there you go. Very, very cool. What do you reckon of that, Mr. Aaron? 
I reckon um, I'll always go for physical media over printed media. What you were saying with books, so many people collect comics. They won't go to the digital comics. They want the actual comics. You know, there's something different. That is a good point indeed. There you go. And that's a good point. Yeah, you need the contacts to get the files. Uh, yeah, if they made them public, that would be good. So you could print them out yourself. With that in mind, we are going to buzz off. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the discussion for this particular evening. As always, if you haven't done so already and I've found the wrong button, uh, don't forget to, to check out all the Sci-Fi Zone socials and it's on your know, YouTubes and Instagrams and blah, 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 blah. Most importantly, as we are talking about merchandise earlier, be sure to check out Aaron's store. Absolutely fantastic. He's not there at the moment because he's as sick as a woofer. Is that right, dude? I'm in isolation. I'll be back next week. Very, very groovy. All right, we're going to buzz off a party hard and uh, we will leave you to it. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you next week. Okay, take care and have a good one. Okay, bye for have now. Good night. Bye.